So here comes a professor from Purdue. I could go any place at any institution and talk about psychedelics, and it was okay because Nichols was a professor. He can talk about these in mainstream circles. And there is a lot of interest in mainstream circles in, the, in these drugs. It's just been sort of taboo. So we're, we're seeing that change. 1994 was the first publication of Rick Strassman's studies of DMT in humans. He published a series of three books. You know he published DMT, The Spirit Molecule. That was a summary of a lot of the work that he did. That created a lot of visibility because, as you know, that study in 1993 with DMT was the first clinical study of a hallucinogen that anybody had published for 20 year, at least 20 years. That was a real breakthrough and involved mindset changes with some people at FDA as well. So now it was becoming much more feasible to do these studies. Now you had clinicians looking at this going, well, Strassman did it. Maybe we can do this. So the ball is starting to roll a little bit. <clears throat> then uh, in 1986, Charlie Grobe, Dennis McKenna, et al. went to Brazil, studied ayahuasca use among members of the UDV. Again, establishing here's a legitimate use for these drugs used in a church setting, and it didn't hurt any of these people. They're healthy, they're high functioning, low rate of alcoholism. So now, again, the perception is being built. It's a, these things are okay. The, the public perception that had lingered on about dangerous uh, drugs was slowly being eroded. Not quickly enough, at least, but slowly. <clears throat> Let me go back. I'm not sure if we can go back. Okay. It looks great on the screen here. <clears throat> Then in 1997, a guy named Franz Vollenweider at the University Hospital in Zurich started publishing on psilocybin. And I don't know how many of you are aware of Franz Vollenweider. He is the world's top clinician with psychedelics. Um, he's sort of the golden boy over in uh, Switzerland. They have an organization called the BAG, which is a, a hybrid of the FDA and the DEA. And they allow him to do almost anything. He's done clinical studies of MDMA, psilocybin, He's thinking about LSD. He's, he has given psychedelics to, I think it's four or 500 people. He has a massive da database of EEG, brain scans, psychological measurements. It's unbelievable the work that he's been able to do. And he started publishing then and continues to publish. He's done brain scanning of these receptors, their response to these drugs. At a basic science level, he is the guru. And uh, in the future, when people look back and say, who was really the go-to guy, it's going to be Franz Vollenweider. So if you don't know about him, you might want to check some of the things he's done. <clears throat> um, then in 1999, we published an improved synthesis of psilocybin, because in the Hefter Institute, we've been having a dialogue about what's the best drug to move forward with. LSD still carried too much social baggage. MDMA was becoming controversial. Did it produce neurotoxicity? Uh, what are the problems? So let's go with psilocybin. We had a long dialogue about that. It was clear psilocybin was something that we could use. And Franz Vollenbeiter had the original batch that Sandoz had made. They'd given it all to him. So he was doing studies with psilocybin. The problem is to make psilocybin required a reagent that can detonate spontaneously. That is, you can have a flask of it, and for no reason at all, it explodes. And we were reluctant to work with that reagent. So we spent two or three years developing a better way to make psilocybin. And we did that. It's published now. The Japanese came out with a little tweak that made it better at the end. So we provided the first batch of psilocybin for this study that Roland Griffiths published uh, way back then. So again, we'd made a substance that Roland couldn't get anyplace else for a reasonable price. It's $10,000 a gram for psilocybin if you want to buy it. Uh, that's pretty expensive. So we provide the first batch of psilocybin to Roland in 2000. And then everyone knows in 2006, Roland published a study that psilocybin can induce mystical experiences in normal volunteers, an amazing study, an expansion of the Good Friday experiment. You all may be aware that there was huge press coverage as a result of that paper because Roland's at Johns Hopkins. I'm at Purdue, you know. I mean, where's Purdue? But Johns Hopkins, here's a scientist at Johns Hopkins that gave the ingredient from magic mushrooms to people. And normally you're not allowed to give drugs to people unless there's a medical study where you can demonstrate a possible benefit as compared with the risk. And psychedelics, are, everyone knows how risky they are. There's no possible benefit. How in the world did Griffiths get a study approved by the FDA to give a dangerous drug like psilocybin to normal people who were not suffering from some pathological condition? This was an amazing, amazing study. This is really the big thing that really started getting a lot of press coverage and traction. I think we've got the media on our side. You've seen people filming around here. P 
people are getting curious in the general population. They're hearing about this. What's going on? So Renaissance, you know, maybe we're getting closer now. In 2006, Francisco Marino from University of Arizona published a study where he gave uh, psilocybin to OCD patients. Didn't show it had a positive effect, but showed it be given safely. He's trying to get a larger study done. I don't know if that's going to happen, but again, published psilocybin in human patients, a possible medical indication. 2006, the Supreme Court, as you know, upheld the injunction against the DEA, preventing them from confiscating the wasca from the UDV. Now here we have a religious, a church in New Mexico, and many, I testified as an expert, and many people that you're aware of, Charlie Grobe and others, testified as an expert against the government in that action, saying, leave these people alone. This stuff is not dangerous, it's their religion, leave them alone. We know, you know, they got an injunction that was upheld by the Supreme Court. A lot of people got very excited about that. Again, here's a psychedelic, and people are using it in religious services, and the Supreme Court approves of it. Then, you know, this year Roland Griffiths published a paper showing a 14-month follow-up. These people that he gave psilocybin to that had these mystical experiences and had positive improvements in their life, 14 months later, they're still there. No decrement. Amazing. Long-term changes. These things can change you for the better and produce persisting changes. Charlie Grobe finished a study of psilocybin in terminal cancer patients this year and is working up the data. So presumably those will be in print within the next few months, that'll be another study where we've shown that you can use a psychedelic to treat dying patients and reduce their anxiety and pain, presumably. And now this year we expect, I don't know exactly the timing, but Michael Mithover's study of MDMA and PTSD in South Carolina. If that actually demonstrates a positive effect, you can bet that Rick Dobbins is going to make sure that that's in every newspaper in the world. So what we've seen is this, is it a renaissance? I'm not sure. What, what's the cutoff point? At what point do you say there's a renaissance? And is it, I'm not really sure, but clearly something is happening. It's happening because a, a relatively small number of people have been persistent in their efforts to re-educate the public and to, prov and to provide uh, support to people that are trying to study these in an unbiased and objective way. So, I don't know if you, you probably can't see that. Let me do it one more time. Now, this next slide has got a doctor standing in front of a patient. Watch the doctor's head. I don't know if you can see it or not. That was Sasha's head. <clears throat> the problem I had, and let me just go over a few things that, that we've done in, in my lab. Well, how's a scientist help the movement, so to speak? And you've already seen that basically I provided certified FDA drugs to the clinical studies that have actually carry these out because you can't get all the, these people can't work for years to get approval to do the study and then end up and nobody will make the substance. Nobody wants to deal with it. It's a hassle. There's no market for it. They have to write a report for FDA. It's a lot of trouble. So other than doing that, what kinds of things can you do? I've used rats. We have rats trained to recognize the effects of LSD. And it's actually a pretty good correlation between human effects. We train the rats to recognize LSD and then we give them a new drug and, we, and the rats tell us I think you gave me LSD, or I don't think you did. And that's the best we've been able to do in terms of an animal model. But really, it's pretty good, um, and it's worked for us. We basically have tried to relate the structure of LSD to phenethylamines like mescaline. Spent a lot of time trying to figure that out. And one of the key things there was, you probably can't, and you can't see this at all, but there's a, there's a stereoisomeric, stereoisomeric center here. It was critical to know what that was, and that was really what led us to led me to develop the synthesis of these isomers and get a patent on the procedure. Unfortunately, you can't see any of these slides, but um, we did a lot of work looking at the substituents on amphetamines. So there's ALF1, DOB, DOI, DOM, classical phenethylamines, and what you see on the left, there were Siri these. This is DOI right here, and there's a plot which you can't see that related activity to how fat soluble how fat soluble that iodine or bromine was in that position. We made a radioactive DOI, which was a tool that enabled researchers to study the serotonin 2A receptor, and that's widely used as a commercial product today. We developed the methods along with Sasha and another colleague of his 